recently I was reading Giorgio Bassani's The Novel of Ferrara, and it, I, I began to wonder at the number of famous Italian Jewish authors like, um, well, everyone has heard probably of Primo Levi and Bassani who wrote The Garden of the Finzi Contini. And I, only recently I discovered that uh, famous Italian authors like um, Alberto Moravi and Elsa Morante were half Jewish, Carlo Levi. And then there are even rumors that the current star, Elena Ferrante, may even be of Polish Jewish heritage. So uh, I'm not asking our speaker to answer this question, but uh, I mean, Italy has a tiny Jewish population. I just looked it up before we started tonight. It's only 27,000. Why would a country with so few Jews have such prominence in their, in their literature? So anyway, um, we're privileged to have tonight Professor Nancy Harowitz who is a professor of Italian and Jewish studies at Boston University. Her most recent work includes articles on Primo Levi, Giorgio Bassani, and Carlo Levi. And she published a book in 2017 entitled Primo Levi and the Identity of a Survivor. At Boston University, she teaches courses on modern Italian literature, film and literature produced under fascism, and representations of the Holocaust in literature and film. She directs a new minor in Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights Studies at Boston University. Professor Harowitz, it's, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that lovely introduction, and Shabbat Shalom to everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, and it was lovely to be able to come to your service. I really thank you for that. It was a lovely end to a long week. And I also want to welcome my childhood friend, Mary Raskin, who... <laughs> I invited her to this because I thought she might be interested. And it turns out she knows a bunch of people in your congregation. So thank you, Mary, for coming. Uh, it's a big topic, Italian Jewish authors. It's actually a very big topic. Why? Because as Shirley was no noting, there are quite a few of them in Italy. Um, I do want to try to answer that question about why so many prominent authors are Jewish in Italy. But let me come to that um, by contextualizing what I'm going to say about Italian Jewish authors in general. Uh, first, we really need to think a little bit about the history of Jews in Italy, starting, I'll start actually in the mid 19th century, right before the unification of Italy, which was 1860, 1861. For the previous 300 years, they had been in ghettos in Italy, but the way that worked in most of the ghettos is that the, the Jews that were in the ghettos really behaved a lot like locals. They learned the dialect of the place they were in. Uh, their level of education was also much higher than the people outside the ghetto so that they could converse and interact culturally with the people outside the ghetto, with the non-Jews. So that when the ghettos were opened up, the level and quality of acculturation and speed of acculturation was remarkable. Within one generation, we have uh, Jews who are in the government. We have a famous linguist within about 20 years. I mean, it's very, very fast. It's faster than I think anywhere else in Europe. So the Jews at the time were actually very patriotic. They were, they were nationalistic. They loved the idea of a unified Italy because of what it brought them, that they were able to embrace freedom from the ghettos for the first time. Uh, so the notion of what was Italian was very, very important to them. And as I mentioned, their level of education was much higher because 85% more or less could read uh, and write. And that, and the level of, um, of literacy outside the ghetto was only about 6%. So that's one reason that they, they, they were able to acculturate and um, be very upwardly mobile really quickly. So I'm gonna fast forward now to World War One. World War I, they're, uh, Italy is fighting on the side of the Allies. There's some delay in Italy joining the war effort, but Italy finally does um, after some pressures from a new branch of socialism, which wanted to enter the war and was, which was embracing a nationalistic identity. That new branch of socialist and socialism actually became fascism. Uh, Margherita Sarfatti was very 
instrumental in the development of fascism. She came from a Jewish family in Venice. Uh, she became very close to Mussolini. She was actually involved with him romantically for more than 20, 30 years, a very long time. Uh, she abandoned her own Jewishness and converted to Catholicism when the regime started to get anti-Semitic, which starts to happen in the mid 1930s. Um, so back to the Italian Jews, they're very, the rest of the Italian Jews, I should say, they are embracing the new Italy. They're very identified as being Italian first and Jewish second is the case with just about all of them. So that when fascism comes to power in 1922, a lot of them join the fascist party because we have to remember that fascism was an entirely new concept. Mussolini and the rest of the Grand uh, Council and Sarfati as his advisor, who was, she was actually much more educated than he was, so she was helping him learn philosophy and history. Um, they're making it up as they go along. They're literally making up fascism as they go along and they're trying to appeal to a lot of people. They're trying to appeal to the landowners, to the business owners, to the blue collar workers, to the contadini out in the fields. They're trying to, he's really trying to come up with something that will appeal to everybody and continue the unification of Italy. He even is trying to appeal to the Vatican. And in fact, there's a, there's a concordat with the Vatican in which they basically each agree to mind their own business and not interfere. So the Vatican has a very complicated uh, relationship with fascism. That's when Vatican City actually gets established. So a lot of Jews, a lot of Italian Jews have joined the fascist party in the 1920s. Then as time goes on, fascism starts to reveal itself as the, the bloody conquering repressive regime that it fully turns into by the end of the 1930s. Uh, and Jews start dropping out of the fascist party. And then in about 1936, uh, a magazine is established called La Difesa della Razza, which means the defense of the race. And it's very racialistic. It's, it's, it's anti-Semitic, it's extremely anti-Semitic. And at that point, you can see that the fascist ideology is starting to change and starting to embrace anti-Semitism. Hard to say at that point how much is pressure from Hitler because he's only been in power about three years. Um, but that's the, that's the way the tide is going basically towards um, a, a very, uh, a strong rhetoric of anti-Semitism in Italy. So two years later, the racial laws are published. Right before that, there's something, it appears in the newspapers, a full page spread called the Manifest of Racial, of Racial Scientists, which is signed by 10 so-called scientists. It turns out they're not scientists at all, they're fascist ideologues, but it claims that, uh, that Italians are pure Aryans, which is, it's kind of ridiculous, but you know, I mean, that, that notion of Aryan is of course, blonde, blue-eyed, most Italians are not blonde and blue-eyed, but they're trying to set the stage for uh, anti-Semitism in Italy, for a stronger anti-Semitism. There had always been a church-sponsored anti-Semitism, but it came in waves uh, and wasn't really that strong. Um, so the Italian Jews are in a very difficult position at this point. They feel completely betrayed by this country that they love and that they've lived in for a long, long time. There's a Roman Jewish community that's been there for what, 1700 years at that point, almost 2000 years. So, and a lot of the other Jewish communities have been there since the 1500s. So the Italian Jews start to back away from fascism, uh, but maybe not quite fast enough. So they feel very, very betrayed. They don't know what to do. They are feel trapped by these new circumstances. The fact that the racial laws are enacted in 1938 take, takes away most of their civil rights. So for example, they're not allowed to employ more than a certain number of people. So businesses have to shut down in some cases. They're not allowed to employ non-Jews in their homes. And at that time in Italy, the middle class, the middle class family usually had a maid and they weren't allowed to employ any maids unless they were Jewish, just as any, or gardeners, chauffeurs, anybody. Uh, they were not allowed to publish their name in the phone book which for us might seem like a minor matter, but it really isn't because that's a way of, of stating an identity of being part of a, of a society. Uh, do you remember phone books? We used to have, <laughs> we used to have phone books. Um, 
So this is really a big shock to them. And the, the, probably the worst thing is that they all, all the Jewish children get kicked out of the state schools. In Italy, just about all the schools are state schools. There isn't really a system of private schools. There's one big private university in Milan, and that's about it, or at least it was at the time. There still aren't really very many private schools. So the fact that all the Italian, all the Italian Jewish children get kicked out of the schools causes a huge hardship for the Jewish community that's already suffering economically because of people losing their jobs over the racial laws. They start, the community start their own little schools in some cases. Primo Levi actually was teaching at one for a while. So it's really a very huge shock to them. Big betrayal. Um, then in 1943, Germany and Italy part ways as allies. The Germans invade and they start the deportations in the fall of 1943. Where do the Italians stand on this? How, how complicitous were they? How much bystander complicity was there? How much overt complicity and collaboration on the part of the fascists? Quite a bit. Um, this was something that was covered up in Italian history and, and society for quite a while after the war because I think they were ashamed of it basically. But historians about 25 years ago started doing more work and realized that those deportations were not only carried out by Nazis, by the, the Germans who had invaded, they were carried out by fascists also. So <laughs> that's, that's a very quick context for you. Um, about 15% of Italy's Jews were deported. Very few returned out of the ones that did uh, get deported. Um, many of them hid. A lot of Italians hid them. There was a, a lot of courageous acts by the part of Italians to, to help their neighbors, to help their friends. Uh, some turned them in, uh, so you get a variety of response. So there you have it. Very, very quick. What was that, about three minute <laughs> introduction to Jews in Italy and the context in which we find these writers. So who are the writers? This is an interesting question. What, and I'm going to go right into what makes a Jew, right? Because if you have a writer like Alberto Moravia, who's one of Italy's most important writers of the 20th century, wrote very important novels, for example, he's half Jewish. Did he have a Jewish identity? Not really. Does he talk about Jews in his work? No. So do we consider him to be an Italian Jewish author? The same goes for uh, Italos Favo is a little more closer to ha actually having a Jewish identity. He, Italos Favo is a very important, also very important novelist, born in Trieste during the Austrian uh, uh, Empire, so that critics, in, but he wrote in Italian. He had an Italian, let me see if I get this straight, his father was German Jewish and his mother was Italian Catholic. He writes in Italian, and the Italian cultural critics at the time are not sure that his Italian is quite up to snuff. So they're kind of marginalizing him a little bit. I think also because he was half Jewish. Does he talk about Jews? He mentions something at the end of his most important novel, The Confessions of Zeno, but he doesn't really engage Jewish themes. So do we use that as a measure to decide if someone's a Jewish author? I mean, this is a question that gets asked a lot about a lot of different, a, a lot of different writers. Uh, I should mention Elsa Morante, uh, who wrote a very important novel called uh, History uh, in 1974, I believe. Uh, she was involved with Moravia for many years. Um, she too was half Jewish, but how Jewish is half Jewish? In her case, a little bit more. She talks about some Jewish themes in, um, in her novel History, which was a huge novel and bestseller in Italy. Uh, Natalia Ginsberg is another one, half Jewish. She does, she wrote a novel called, well, it's really not, it's, it's almost an autobiography called Family Sayings. She has a Jewish father, uh, Russian Jewish actually, and a uh, Catholic mother. And she does talk about some religious tension in the home and some Jewish themes come in a little bit. So, you know, what's, <laughs> what side do we put her on? She's actually really interesting because of the fact that she calls her more or less autobiographical novel uh, a biography of her family. So she's already kind of splitting hairs in terms of definitions and identities. Uh, let's see what else I can say about that. I think that's probably enough about the other Jewish authors, but as Shirley mentioned, there really are quite a few. 
To get back to trying to answer the question of why so many in such a small Jewish population, we're talking about one and a half percent of the of the population of Italy, I think it's because of the long uh, tradition of acculturation in Italy and how comfortable Italian Jews were there for so many generations. Uh, so that they're writing from, really from the viewpoint of being deeply Italian. And the Jewish part is there too, in some cases, not perhaps quite as strongly as we might imagine it to be. Except for the two authors that I'm going to talk about uh, right now. The first one is Giorgio Bassani. Giorgio Bassani was born in 1916 in Ferrara, which is a city in Northern Italy. He died in 2000. He's also one of Italy's most important novelists. His work is really splendid. I don't know how many of you have ever read The Garden of the Finzi Contini, or perhaps seen the film that the novel was taken from, but it was a very important cultural contribution and it's about Jews in Ferrara. So he does not hold back from approaching Jewish themes, from deeply engaging with the trauma of the betrayal of Italian Jews during fascism. As one of the things I admire the most about him as a writer is his courage, because he's writing these stories and novels starting in the 1950s, when no one in Italy wants to talk about it. They do not want to talk about what happened to the Jews. They want to talk about the partisans, the anti-fascists, uh, what was getting published at the time were stories of heroism. They're trying to recover from the, the shock and the shame of fascism and the collaboration with the Nazis. So Bassani doesn't care. He just starts writing these stories about Ferrara in which he's talking about the Jews of Ferrara and what happened to them. It's fascinating, actually, that he did this so early on. I, as I've gone on in my career and done more and more research, I've been really just uh, amazed and stunned by the chutzpah, actually, of, of talking about these matters in the 1950s. Um, so he wrote The Garden of the Finzi Contini, published that in 1962. He published um, a group of short stories called uh, Beyond the Wall, in some cases. It has actually different names of five or six stories about Ferrara. Um, his daughter is an art historian who actually came to Boston University when we invited her to speak before showing the Garden of the Finzi Contini film. Um, and she said that he had a very intense writing practice, which was that he would write every day from 6 a.m. to noon, absolutely every day. And usually, often, he would only produce a paragraph in that time. So, and then, <laughs> and then that's not slow enough for you. He then rewrote everything and republished everything at least three times. So if you're a Bassani scholar, you're spending a whole lot of time comparing editions um, <laughs> because of looking at the changes, tracking the changes, trying to figure out why he would change one thing here and not there. Um, his prose is very, very concise. And surely, I must say, you have my admiration for, I think you mentioned to me, you read all of the novel of Ferrara. Let me just show everybody what that looks like. This is the book. And this is how thick the book is. I mean, it's really, it's probably, it's at least 800 pages. Um, so I'm, I'm impressed with, <laughs> with this for reading all of it. Uh, but his work is really, it's stunning. It's very concise. Uh, his prose is very elusive, meaning that his sentences are tremendously long. I can't imagine. Well, actually, I once did translate one of his stories and it almost drove me crazy because the sentences are so long and he does parenthetical um, remarks in the middle of them. So he'll be talking about one thing and then he'll start talking, he'll start making allusions to other things in the middle of this very long sentence and then finally get somewhere else completely different by the end of the sentence. Um, so what else is interesting about Bassani? He is not a survivor. He hid out during the German occupation. He was actually a partisan, anti-fascist. Um, he also contributed a lot to how we think about cultural memory through the way he articulates remembering the past, talking about the past, um, and nostalgia and what that means and what it means to look at the past really carefully and really deeply while holding it close to your heart. So I actually want to, wait a minute, I was going to share a screen here. Mm -hmm. Let's see if this works. 
Yes. Oh, I think you're seeing a whole bunch of pictures, aren't you? Well, this picture right here, that is Giorgio Bassani. And there are a couple of pictures of Primo Levi. Are you seeing like three different pictures? No, just the one. Just the one, good, perfect. Okay, all right, um, I'm gonna read a little bit as you stare at this picture of Bassani. From the prologue, um, from the prologue to the Garden of the Finci Contini. It's a very, very important way that he's setting up this long novel, uh, which is in part a love story. Um, he says this, for many years I have wanted to write about the Finci Contini, about Micol and Alberto, Professor Hermano and Signora Olga, and about the many others who lived at, or like me frequented, the house in Corso, uh, Ercole I of Deste, Ferrara, just before the last war broke out. But the impulse, the prompt, really to do so, only occurred for me a year ago, one April Sunday in 1957. It was during one of our usual weekend outings. 10 or so friends piled into a couple of cars and we set out along the Aurelia soon after lunch without any clear destination. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Having reached the Aurelia again after a short while, we caught sight of the fork in the road that led to Cerverteri. Since it had been decided that we should return immediately to Rome, I had no doubt that we would keep straight on. But instead of doing so, our car slowed down more than was required and Janina's father, Janina is a little girl that is in the car with them. Uh, Janina's father stuck his hand out of the window, signaling to the second car about 25 meters behind that he intended to turn left. He had changed his mind. So we found ourselves taking the smooth, narrow, asphalted street, which in no time leads to a small huddle of mainly recent houses, and from there winds further on toward the hills of the hinterland up to the famous Etruscan necropolis. No one asked for any explanations, and I too remained silent. Beyond the village, the street in gentle ascent forced the car to slow down. We then passed by the burial mounds, which have been scattered across that whole stretch of Lazian territory north of Rome, but more in those parts toward the hills than toward the sea, a stretch which is, therefore, nothing but an immense, almost interrupted, cemetery. Where are we going? asked Janina. Husband and wife were sitting in the front seat with the child in between them. Her father took his hand off the wheel and let it rest on his daughter's dark brown curls. We're going to have a look at some tombs which are more than four or 5,000 years old, he replied with the tone of someone who is about to tell a fairy tale and so doesn't mind exaggerating as far as the numbers go. The Etruscan tombs. How sad, Janina sighed, leaning her neck on the back of the seat. Why sad? Haven't they taught you who the Etruscans were at school? In the history book, the Etruscans are at the beginning next to the Egyptians and the Jews. But Papa, who do you think were the oldest, the Etruscans or the Jews? Her father burst out laughing. Try asking that gentleman, he said, signaling toward me with his thumb. Janina turned around. With her mouth hidden behind the back of the seat, severe and full of diffidence, she cast a quick glance at me. I waited for her to repeat the question, but no word escaped her. She quickly turned around again and stared in front of her. Descending the street, always at a slight gradient and flanked by a double row of cypresses, we came upon a group of country folk, lads and lasses. It was the Sunday passeggiata, the walk. With linked arms, some of the girls at times made exclusively female chains of five or six. How strange they look, I said to myself. At the moment we passed them, they peered through the windows with their laughing eyes in which curiosity was mingled with a bizarre pride a barely concealed disdain. How strange they looked, how beautiful and free. Papa, Janina asked once again, why are old tombs less sad than new ones? Her father put the car into second gear as he thought about this. Well, he replied, the recent dead are closer to us. And so it makes sense that we care more about them. The Etruscans, they've been dead such a long time once again, he lapsed into the fairy tale voice. 
It's as though they'd never lived, as though they were always dead. Another pause, this time a longer one, at the end of which we were already very close to the widened space in front of the necropolis's entrance packed with cars and mopeds. It was Janina's turn to become the teacher. But now that you say that, she gently put it, it makes me think the opposite, that the Etruscans really did live and that I care about them just as much as about the others. The whole visit to the necropolis that followed was infused by the extraordinary tenderness of this remark. It had been Janina who had helped us understand. It was she, the youngest, who in some way led us all by the hand. I'm gonna skip now to the very end of this. They're in the car on the way back to Rome. Everyone's falling asleep. It allows him to, to go back in his memory. But once again, in the quiet and torpor, even Janina had fallen asleep. I went over in my memory the years of my early youth, both in Ferrara and in the Jewish cemetery at the end of Via Montebello. I saw once more the large fields scattered with trees, the gravestones and trunks of columns bunched up more densely along the surrounding and dividing walls, and as if again before my eyes, the monumental tomb of the Finci Contini. And my heartstrings tightened as never before at the thought that in that tomb established, it seemed, to guarantee the perpetual repose of its first occupant of him and his descendants, only one of all the Finci Contini's I had known and loved had actually achieved this repose. Only Alberto had been buried there, the oldest who died in 1942 of a lymphogranuloma, while Nicole, the daughter, born second, and their father, Hermano, and their mother, Signora Olga, and Signora Regina, her ancient paralytic mother, were all deported to Germany in the autumn of 1943, and no one knows if they found any burial at all. This is how he starts his novel, with this prologue in which he brings in the Etruscans, he brings in the ancient history of the Jews, he brings in memory and commemoration. How do we remember the past? How, do, how does that work? That the child actually uh, gets them all thinking about what it means to really think about Etruscan tombs. What does it mean to go visit these ancient tombs? Are we thinking about the fact there are really people there? Or is it just some tourist curiosity? He brings it really full circle in this prologue before he starts the novel, which is both about uh, a love story between the narrator and Nicole, uh, a love story that doesn't work out so well. Um, and it's also about the Jews of Ferrara. His family, Giorgio's family, uh, is on the side of more conservative Jews who are hoping that Mussolini is not so bad. The Finci Contini uh, instead are of the opinion that Jews should now keep to themselves and isolate themselves and lean on each other, have their own, their own culture and not try to uh, acculturate anymore because of what's going on. And then of course it all ends in tragedy when the family is deported. Giorgio gets away. George, we have to remember that Giorgio is the narrator. It, this is a novel, but his name, the author's name is Giorgio Bassani. So it, it's not a big jump to think that it's at least partially autobiographical. There was no Finzi Contini family in Ferrara. The garden doesn't exist, despite the efforts of tourists to find it. <laughs> tourists are always going to Ferrara and looking for the garden of the Finzi Contini. It doesn't really exist. But the themes and what Bassani wants to explore here are very real in terms of their, their impact on the Italian Jewish community on the, uh, of the time. Um, I think at this point, because I'm going to run out of time here pretty soon, I think I'd better... Actually, let me just see if anybody has a question about Bassani before I move on to Primo Levi. Um, let's see if I can figure out how to stop the share. There we go. Okay. If you don't have questions, that's fine. I just thought I'd... I have a question uh, regarding you're talking about he rewrote and rewrote. It's to the point with the garden. I know there's about three different translations. The I guess the original one, which I have the 1971 paperback. And then there was, I think, two in the around 2000, 2008. So he's very difficult to translate. Did any of these three translations come the closest? Yes. 
William Weaver translated the Garden of the Finzi Contini. That is by far the best translation. This new translation, this one right here, that I keep showing off, just came out a year or two ago. Uh, I was asked to write a review of it and I wasn't too sure what to do because it's a little bit under translated in some places. It's not fabulous. On the other hand, it's not terrible. And Bassani is really a challenge. So if you want to see Bassani's works all together in one place, it's an excellent choice. If you just want to read the novel, The Garden of the Finzi Contini, I would look for the William Weaver edition, which is still out there. So the first one was kind of a, because I remember reading it and it seemed very choppy. And I saw a later translation that was a lot more um, graphic in some ways. In some ways, I don't know if that was even more accurate. Uh, I don't remember which one, uh, modern one I read. But then the follow-up question, if the, regarding Fitzy, and I'll, I'll stop here. Do you think if it was re, uh, remade, that film, it would be very different as a movie now, as opposed to the 1970s film? Because the 1970 film seems very flat and tame. What do you mean by flat and tame? I think we know more as an audience about, as you indicated, from research and from r reporting and also the stories. So I think an American audience, at least, would accept a little bit more uh, focus and detail. Mm -hmm. And I think the movie, which I really didn't like, and I read, I saw it before the book, and I enjoyed the book more because I got more involved in the characters. Mm -hmm. um, it would probably be more um, accented and more clear, I think, than the movie. In in sense of in sense of the um, times and the uh, attitudes. Those are all good points. Yes, I think, well, there's one really big problem with the film, which is that Giorgio Bassani had agreed to be in the screenwriter and he angrily stomped off the set when they made it clear to him that they were changing the ending. He was not at all happy. In the novel, wait a minute, should I be talking about the end of the novel? Is anybody, anybody going to want to read it? Let me say this. I'll try to be subtle about this. The end of the novel is very... Uh, unclear exactly what happens between a couple of the characters. I think I'm being subtle enough here. So that you don't know exactly, you know what the suspicions of the narrator are, but it's not spelled out for you. In the film, they spell it out. They absolutely spell it out. And then the film, which just really annoyed Bassani. He was really, really mad about it uh, and wrote some scathing articles about it. Um, and then they add the deportation scene, which is actually beautiful. It's beautifully done uh, at the end. Uh, the scene of the, the Jews in Ferrara being closed up in a, in a classroom waiting to be deported is really very, very beautiful. And it kind of saves the film, I think, in some ways. Otherwise, it would have just been a slightly trashy love story. Um, how would they do it today? I imagine they wouldn't have changed the ending, but maybe they would have wanted to. I mean, it's, it's hard to say. It is kind of a product of the 70s. The film. De Sica as a director was an interesting choice. He was doing a lot of action films at the time. So, you know, these, these choices are always hard to second guess. It definitely has the earmarks of a big future film though. So what gets sacrificed either in what's in a novel or what's in history when you start mixing in the demands of big feature film? Thank you. You're welcome. I guess I should jump into Levy because I don't, I didn't actually pay attention when I started, but imagine I don't have all day. Um, Primo Levy, very important author, very important to Holocaust studies. He's the second most read um, author in, uh, in terms of Holocaust testimonies. He published his testimony in 1947, but not without a fight which actually gets into what I was saying earlier about post-war Italy not wanting to think about these matters. He could not find a mainstream publisher to publish Survival in Auschwitz, or the real Italian title is, If This is a Man. Uh, he finally had to go with a very small publisher in Florence who published something like 2,500 copies, half of which were lost in the Florence floods of 1966, which tells you that it didn't sell very well at the time. Really nobody wanted to think about this issue. Um, he prevailed. The, 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 the testimony finally received the attention it deserved. Um, and so he kept writing. He was very, very interested in being a writer, even though he was the manager of a paint factory. 
he had managed to finish his university studies despite the racial laws because often professors would uh, look the other way if they had a Jewish student, as long as that Jewish student was already enrolled and already in a major. He couldn't change majors, which is something he wanted to do. He was born in Turin in Northern Italy to a somewhat acculturated Jewish family. Um, had a Jewish identity, had a bar mitzvah. Uh, even though later on he said he felt that he was mostly Italian and only 5% Jewish, his writings really don't speak to that kind of percentage. <laughs> he, he, he engages Jewish themes. He wrote a, a, a novel, a fictional novel about Jewish partisans in Eastern Europe. So he was definitely interested in engaging his Jewish identity, but he also resented being um, pigeonholed as only a Jewish writer, which happened to him a lot in Italy and abroad. He didn't like that because he felt very Italian along with the other, other Jewish writers I mentioned. Um, he was deported to Auschwitz, was there for about a year, and then it took him about a year to get back to Italy. And he wrote not only the testimony of his time in Auschwitz, which is a very important text because he goes into a lot of detail. He was extremely observant and extremely philosophical in his approach. So one learns a lot about the system at Auschwitz by reading Survival in Auschwitz. Uh, he then wrote another testimony, The Reawakening, which is really called The Truce in Italian, uh, about the almost a year that took him to get home. It's kind of joyous in some parts. It's also framed by Auschwitz and framed by the Holocaust. Very, very interesting text. Uh, then he goes on to write science fiction stories, some of which are very playful and some of which have to do with the Holocaust and are very serious. He wrote poetry um, and he wrote a lot of essays. He published a book called uh, The Drowned and the Saved. Once again, you know, you could really write a whole paper about how American publishers have changed the names of Leffy's publications because it's not the drowned and the saved, it's the submerged and the saved. And if you think about it, there's a difference between being submerged and being drowned. Anyway, in English, it's called The Drowned and the Saved, a collection of essays, including a very famous and influential essay entitled The Gray Zone, which is about people in the middle. Uh, Sometimes it's bystander complicity. Sometimes it's people who were forced to do certain jobs at the camp or took on the task of certain jobs at the camp in order to survive and how we think about them versus perpetrators. He wrote another really important essay in that same collection about shame and the survivor shame that he felt, not guilt, shame, because it became part of his identity. Um, that came out in 1986, a year before he died by a suicide, 1987. Lots of conversation about whether or not it was really a suicide. I think the evidence all points to the fact that it was a suicide, but he didn't leave a note. And it was a very big shock uh, to the world when this happened. Um, I'm trying to give you a crash course on Primo Levi. I actually want to read one of his poetries, but you know what? I think it's on my screen. Okay, let me push this magic button again. There it is. Yes, okay. This is a poem that he published in 1984. He's not really known for his poetry, but he actually wrote really beautiful poetry. So I'm going to read it. Hopefully not quite the clip I've been speaking. I'll try to slow down a little bit. Uh, and then I'll mention, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the literary references in the poem. Since then, at an uncertain hour, that pain returns. And if he does not find someone to listen, his heart burns in his chest. He sees again the faces of his companions, pale in first lights, gray from cement dust, indistinct in the fog. Shaded by death in restless sleep at night, they work their jaws in the oppressive weight of dreams, chewing a turnip that isn't there. Stand back, away from here, submerged people. Go away, I haven't supplanted anyone, haven't usurped anyone's bread. No one died in my place, no one. Go back into your fog. It's not my fault if I live and breathe and eat and drink and sleep and put on clothes. So as you can hear, it's a very intense poem. It begins with a reference to Coleridge, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, uh, which is really an amazing long epic poem. Uh, that he borrows. He, 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 it's at the beginning of this one, uh, this poem. It's at the beginning of one of his essays. 
he was really struck by the idea of the ancient mariner who goes around tugging on people's sleeves, nudging people until they'll listen to his story of woe, because that's how he felt, Levy himself. That's what he says anyway, that he's going around trying to get people to hear the story of what happened during the Holocaust, what happened to him at Auschwitz. Um, so that first line is directly from Coleridge. Uh, also, the, his heart burns in his chest is another reference to Coleridge. But then he says here, he sees again the faces of his companions. These are dead companions. These are those that were lost in the camp. Pale at first light, gray from cement dust, indistinct in the fog, shaded by death in restless sleep. So he's talking about what they were like. But right here, he's addressing them directly when he says, stand back away from here, submerge, people go away. I haven't supplanted anyone. That is his survivor guilt, his survivor shame coming through in this poem. Haven't usurped anyone's bread. In other words, I didn't take anybody else's bread to survive. I just survived. No one died in my place. No one go back into your fog. So you can see how haunted he is by his experience by what happened to him, what happened to the others. And then at the end, <laughs> this, is, this is a very typical Levy strategy, literary strategy, because he uses a lot of literary strategies. He, he cites Dante all throughout Survival in Auschwitz. He's doing it again here. It's not my fault if I live and breathe and eat and drink and sleep and put on clothes. That last line is from Dante. It's from the canto in which he talks about the betrayers. So it's the kind of reference that only someone who knows Dante fairly well is going to get. But we have to remember that the Italian uh, public, Italian readers, knew Dante really well. And so they would have actually gotten that, that uh, quotation, that citation of Dante. Uh, 